the subject of today's session in keeping with the series on Isaiah comprises the last part of chapter 10 and the first part, most of chapter 11. As we've noted in the past, while we are aiming to keep to a rhythm of approximately a chapter per session, the breakdown doesn't necessarily conform to the standard division into chapters, which is a relatively recent division of the books of the Bible, and one that often does not serve well in considering the themes that emerge from the passages themselves. And in particular here, I think there is actually great importance in our conjoining the end of chapter 10 to the beginning of chapter 11. You see on your screens right now, the beginning of chapter 11, we will be returning to the last part of chapter 10 before delving into chapter 11. But the reason I'm stressing it at the outset is because, of course, the beginning of chapter 11 is a passage that I suspect we all know on one level or another very well. And there shall go forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse and a twig shall grow forth out of his roots. And I must admit that typically, when I personally am asked, where do I see the affirmation of belief in the coming of the Messiah, most explicitly articulated in the Bible? Usually, although there are, of course, a number of salient passages that we could cite, I start with this one. And indeed, unequivocally, we do see these majestic, eternal, timeless words of the prophet as pertaining to the messianic era that yet awaits us. And yet simultaneously, that's the note upon which I'd like to begin here. And this is a subject that we have had occasion to address previously, in particular in the question and answer sessions, sessions 18 and 19, how do we relate to the words of the prophet here? We've discussed this essential point on a number of occasions in our study of Isaiah as well. The prophet, on the most basic plane, on the most immediate level, isn't speaking about the coming of the Messiah. That is, it becomes clear, and we'll have occasion to see this more clearly as we consider the closing words of chapter 10 that are conjoined with these opening words. The prophet did not divide his words into chapters. Words that are speaking of the destruction of the Assyrians who have laid siege to Jerusalem. And on the most basic plane, it's really inescapable to conclude that that shoot that goes forth from the stock of Jesse on the most basic plane is King Hezekiah, Hezekiahu, which of course inevitably raises the question, does it have to do with the coming of the Messiah? Altogether, beyond, as we've noted on many occasions in the past, asking the most basic question. What is the prophet saying? What is he saying to his contemporaries in his time, in his place, in the circumstances in which he was speaking? We still need to ask, what is he saying to us? After all, we don't regard what he's saying as only pertaining to the immediate audience that first heard his words. So indeed, I think that's an important starting point here, because we are going to need to dwell upon what he's saying in his context. To what extent do these words address us? And I'd like to, in this regard, 
stress, maybe repeat some thoughts that we've already expressed on this subject in the past. And that is, when we consider what we read in Isaiah chapter 55, we read of what the impact of the words of the prophet is on an ongoing basis, on a conclusive permanent basis. In verse 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Verse 10, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not there, except that it waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me empty-handed, except that it accomplishes that which I desire and makes the thing whereto I sent it prosper. So the words of the prophet never go back empty-handed. And of course, inevitably, we appreciate in that context, and we've noted this again in the question and answer sessions as well, that that clearly poses a challenge to us. To cite just two very brief examples of many that we could discuss. In the second chapter of Haggai, Haggai, like Zechariah and Malachi, prophesying in the second temple. We read, beginning in verse 6, Thus says the God of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, and the choicest things of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory says the God of hosts. Mine is the silver and mine is the gold, says the God of hosts. The glory of this latter house, the temple, rebuilt, shall be greater than that of the former, says the God of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the God of hosts. It didn't happen. The second temple, certainly in the time of Haggai, was but a pale shadow of the glory of the first temple. And perhaps even more glaringly, in the second chapter of Zechariah, also in the second temple period, beginning in verse 14, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of you, says God, and many nations shall join themselves to God in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you. And you will know that the God of hosts has sent me unto you. A promised restoration. God is coming. Everything that was lost when the first temple was destroyed will be restored. Right? Wrong. It didn't happen. We've discussed elsewhere why it didn't happen. That, unfortunately... The nation of Israel, when summoned to return home after the Babylonian exile, failed to rouse itself to the call. And as a result, since while God is always pouring out his spirit, we need to prepare the vessels to receive it. These words weren't fulfilled in the second temple. That second temple could have been, should have been, might have been the final temple standing for all eternity. But instead, it was but a temporary respite between the Babylonian exile and the far more devastating exile that followed the destruction of the second temple. So what happens with these words? The words of Haggai, the words of Zechariah. Of course, the answer, as we've discussed previously, is, again, as Isaiah expressed it, the word that goes forth out of God's mouth shall not return empty-handed. Shall not return empty-handed, those words will be fulfilled. They weren't fulfilled in the time of the Second Temple. 
they will yet be fulfilled because God's promise is irrevocable. And of course, ultimately, that's going to be the key, the foundation to understanding the passage that we're discussing this evening. That is, when we read in Isaiah chapter 11 of that shoot that comes out of the stock of Jesse, we are indeed reading about something that might have been fulfilled in the time of King Hezekiah, King Chizkiahu. It wasn't, and that only confirms our confidence that it will be fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah. So, is Isaiah speaking about his own time? Or is he speaking about the coming of the Messiah? And of course, inevitably, our answer is yes. That is the most basic level of meaning, of course, pertains to his own time. But simultaneously, his words pertain to our time. They are indeed everlasting as all of God's promises are. Okay, so on that note, then, we return to the beginning of today's passage, and we consider the last verses first of chapter 10. Remember, we read in the foregoing verses of the eventual fate of Assyria. And it is on that note that we continue with chapter 10, verse 20. It will come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and they that are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again lean upon him that spoke them, but shall lean upon God, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. And maybe before we continue, we should focus upon in truth. Because unfortunately, not everyone really turns to God in truth. We've seen these words of warning in Isaiah previously. They're from chapter 29. When God speaks of this people who draw near, they're drawing near, at least superficially. And with their mouth and with their lips, they honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment of men learned by rote, like the actions of automatons. Therefore, behold, I will add confounding obscurity to this people, even obscurity upon obscurity. And the wisdom of their wise men will be lost. And the understanding of their understanding men shall be hid. Such grievous punishment. Why? Because they drew near. They drew near and undoubtedly could congratulate themselves with how religiously devout they are. But they're only drawing near with their mouth and their lips, and not with their heart. We have a saying, an ancient saying, in our tradition, God demands the heart. That's not a substitute for fidelity through everything else that we do. But if everything we do is just the action of automatons without the heart, we haven't even begun. So, again, the prophet speaks of those who lean upon God, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Which is, of course, not merely a promise, but very much a summons. A remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto God the Mighty. Now I have blocked a remnant shall return, and God the mighty. And I've also highlighted those words in the Hebrew. 
Sha'ar Yashuv, a remnant shall return, God the Mighty, El Gibor, and indeed the expression, a remnant shall return, Sha'ar Yashuv, appears in the following verse as well. And inevitably, we need to recall that we've encountered these expressions previously as names. In chapter 7, in verse 3, then said God unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Achaz and Sha'ar Yashuv. Literally, a remnant shall return. Your son. This is the name of the prophet's son. One of them. We've discussed the others. So, that son signifies something that's taking place, well, very possibly years later. Because, of course, chapter 7, verse 3 is taking place in the reign of King Ahaz. And it becomes very clear from what we read in the verses that ensue that in chapter 10 here, we're discussing the reign of his righteous son, Hezekiah, Chizkiyahu. But the son's name is still prescient and relevant. And as for God the Mighty, remember in chapter 9, in verse 5, a child is born unto us, a son is given unto us, and the government is placed upon his shoulder, and his name is called Pela Yoetz El Gibor Aviad Sar Shalom. Wondrous advisor of the mighty God, of the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Or, as we noted, alternatively, we could read the Hebrew as, and the wondrous advisor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, called his name the Prince of Peace. In either case, as we noted, since the birth of this son pertains likewise to being liberated from the crushing yoke of the Assyrian Empire, obviously, this is a son who's being born in the time of the prophet Isaiah. We're not discussing the additional levels of meaning. Indeed, there can be additional levels of meaning. For the plain meaning of the text is certainly talking about what was being born in the lifetime of the prophet. And in context, the most plausible identification is the prophet here is speaking of that king during whose reign the yoke of Assyria will be broken. King Hezekiah. Chizkiyahu. It's interesting to note that El Gibor, that expression that we've bold faced here, mighty God or God the mighty, is very similar in its meaning to the name of the king, Hezekiah, Chizkiyahu, strength of God. So indeed, an intimation of that which will be in the names, much along the lines of what we already saw in chapter 8. In verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom God has given me shall be for portents and tokens in Israel from the God of hosts who dwell in Mount Zion. So, indeed, we can't help but note that possibly years later, the prophet makes reference to these names once again because they still are portents. They still are tokens. God's plan is still unfolding. And these names signify that everything that is unfolding is indeed part of his plan. There is a guide. There is an author. There's someone who is at the steering wheel of history. So again, a remnant shall return unto God the mighty. 
in verse 22. Now, I have to admit that verse 22 can be rendered in more than one way. The Hebrew is ambiguous. We can render it as, for though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them shall return. Again, Sha'ar Yashuv. Only a remnant because an extermination is determined, overflowing with righteousness. Because even in Israel, there are those who will not be saved. Only a remnant will return. That's one way of understanding this verse. The alternative conveys a very different message. And the truth is they're both valid messages. For if your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, the remnant of them that shall return shall wash away with righteousness the decreed destruction. Because that remnant that returns is going to be worthy, and they are going to be saved. And through their righteousness, they will indeed wash away the decreed destruction that might otherwise have impinged upon them. Well, that's true too. There is going to be the extermination. There is going to be the judgment. And indeed, as we read in verse 23, for an extermination, wholly determined shall God, the God of hosts, make in the midst of all the earth or all the land. Again, whether we're speaking on the plane of only the land of Israel or the entire world isn't clear. The Hebrew is susceptible to both interpretations. But what we stress here is, yes, there is going to be that extermination, that extermination will first and foremost be against the enemy. Verse 24, therefore, thus says God, the God of hosts, O my people who dwells in Zion, my people, no, not your people, my people, says God. The ones who are my people who have indeed returned to God. Be not afraid of Assyria. Though he smites you with the rod and lifts up his staff against you in the way of Egypt, it's only temporary. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall be over. That is, whatever has been decreed as punishment for Israel has reached its bounds. And my anger shall be to their destruction, to Assyria's destruction, because of their blasphemy, because of Assyria's blasphemy, as we discussed in the earlier passage in chapter 10. And the God of hosts shall rouse against him a scourge, as in the smiting of Midian at the rock of Orev, and as his staff was over the sea, so shall he carry him off in the way of Egypt. There is, of course, an irony that carrying him off in the way of Egypt is the manner in which Assyria will meet its destruction. The very same expression described what Assyria thought to impose upon Israel. Now, before we move on, we need to clarify what's going on in verse 26, the smiting of Midian at the rock of Orev and his staff over the sea. Well, when we consider the relevant passages in the Bible, the meaning becomes clear. That is, in Judges chapter 7, we read of Gideon's battle against the Midian occupiers of the land who were oppressing Israel. And the part that's relevant for our purposes in chapter 7, verse 25 is, and they took the two princes of Midian, Orev and Zev, 
and they slew Orev at the rock of Orev. And Zev they slew at the winepress of Zev and pursued Midian. Indeed, we read of this battle again also in Psalm 83, where with respect to the enemies of God who are attempting to destroy his people, the psalmist beseeches God in verse 10, do you unto them as unto Midian and other enemies of Israel. And specifically in verse 12, make their nobles like Orev and Zev. These are the princes of Midian, together with Zevach and Salmona. Now, what's interesting to note, of course, is that we're referring to a battle that has taken place centuries earlier than either the prophet Isaiah or his audience. Obviously, with respect to the staff over the sea, the reference is to the splitting of the sea. When God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 14, verse 16, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and cleave it. And the children of Israel will come into the midst of the sea on dry ground. And I, behold, I will strengthen the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall come in after them. And I will be glorified through Pharaoh and through all his host, through his chariots and through his horsemen. And Moses, of course, follows the instruction. He stretches out his hand over the sea, and the sea is split. And in verse 26, after Israel has emerged from the sea and the Egyptians have entered the sea, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and God overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even all the host of Pharaoh that came in after them into the sea, and there remained not so much as one of them. But the people of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. So, of course, returning to Isaiah, when Isaiah refers to the slaughter, the smiting of Midian at the rock of Chorev, and God's staff over the sea, we know what he meant. I think we should consider that he would have only expressed himself this way if he knew that his audience also knew what he meant. The lapse of centuries since the splitting of the sea, since the battle of Midian, clearly did not dull their memory. Something of a lesson. I don't know how vividly if we were addressing an audience of our contemporaries, we would expect them to remember a battle that had been fought centuries earlier. But then Israel is summoned to have a very keen historical awareness. The historical consciousness is so acute. We've discussed that consciousness in other contexts as well. Here we see it with respect to the memories that Isaiah invokes in conjuring in the imagination of his audience just what the destruction of the enemy is going to be like. The glory of God, the smiting of God's enemies. And indeed, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall depart from off your shoulder and his yoke from off your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed by reason of fatness or oil, to be more literal. What does that mean? That the yoke will be destroyed by reason of fatness? So, of course, on a purely picturesque plane, we recognize that when you 
place a yoke on a calf. As the calf grows stronger, gets bigger, as it becomes fatter, eventually the very fatness will break the yoke. And of course, on the most basic plane then, the implication of the metaphor is that Israel is going to grow strong and the yoke of Assyria is going to be broken as it grows stronger. But of course, there are deeper levels of meaning as well, aren't there? For example, we might otherwise think that a yoke is something that is at the very least made of some very solid wood, sometimes even of metal. In other words, in the contest between fat and the yoke, generally speaking, we presume the yoke is going to win. We expect that might will prevail. And the prophet wants to assure us it will not prevail. The fatness will prevail more than the yoke. And that brings us to an additional dimension, and that is that oil in many passages in the Bible is an allusion to wisdom, an allusion to light, the light of God's word. And of course, inevitably, on that plane, we appreciate even more so that the message of the prophet is, you see the material strength of Assyria. You see the might of Assyria. That might will be broken through the spirit. The spirit that is sustained by that remnant of Israel that returns to God. But before we get there, what we read in verses 28 through 32 is breathtaking. It is nothing less than a travelogue, a fast-paced record of the advances of the enemy. Because remember, Sennacherib, Sancheriv, is on his way to lay siege to Jerusalem and destroy it. And so, reading the various place locations that begin north of Jerusalem as the enemy sweeps down. He has come to Ayat. He is passed through Migron. At Michmas, he lays up his baggage because he has the narrow ascent of the Vadi to contend with without the baggage. They are gone over the pass. They have taken up their lodging at Geva. Ramah trembles. Gibath Shaul is fled. Cry with a shrill voice, O daughter of Galim. Hearken, O Laish, O Ania, O Anathoth. Madmena wanders. The inhabitants of Gevim gather this onslaught. This very day shall he stand at Nov, shaking his hand at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. We can picture in our mind's eye the besieged inhabitants of Jerusalem. They've already closed the gates, preparing for the worst. And they see the hordes of the Assyrian Empire rolling in, army after army, 185,000 soldiers massed about Jerusalem. And the prophet continues. Verse 33. Behold, the Lord, the God of hosts, shall lop the boughs with terror or with a saw. Because after all, the metaphor here is a forest has come against us. And the high ones of stature shall be hewn down. And the lofty shall be humbled. And he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron. And Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. The destruction. Now, before we consider the destruction itself, 
the theme, the motif of the high ones being hewed down, the lofty being humbled, being laid low. That's a motif we've had occasion to discuss previously. That is, we've seen it, first of all, in Isaiah chapter 2, where we read, and man bows down and becomes humble, and you shall not forgive them. Verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and God alone shall be exalted in that day. For the God of hosts has a day upon all that is proud and lofty, and upon all that is lifted up, and he shall become humble, and upon all the cedars of Lebanon. Note, the self-same motif. The cedars of Lebanon, the mighty trees that are high and lifted up, all the oaks of Bashan, and there are, of course, additional metaphors of loftiness and pride. And in verse 17, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be humbled, and God alone will be exalted in that day. We saw the same motif in chapter 5. And I can't help but recall that chapter 5 was also a metaphor that pertained to trees, where Israel was likened to a vine. Remember? In chapter 5, verse 15, and man is bowed down, and man is humbled, and the eyes of the lofty are humbled. But the God of hosts is exalted through justice, and God the Holy One is sanctified through righteousness. Now that theme of the humbling of the Hori is one that will yet again recur in Isaiah chapter 26. And the context is, beginning in verse 4, Trust in God forever, for the Lord is God and everlasting rock, for he has humbled them who dwell on high, the lofty city, laying it low, laying it low even to the ground, bringing it even to the dust, so that the foot shall trample it down even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. This theme of the Hori being humbled is one that recurs far too many times in Scripture for us to recount them all. But I do want to note that we find the very same metaphor of the lofty trees being chopped down and the tender ones rising up. That motif occurs twice in the prophet Ezekiel as well. Were these words of Isaiah his inspiration? Could be. We don't know for sure. But in Ezekiel chapter 17, we read that God will take the lofty top of the cedar, crop off the young twigs, and replant them. And the real message in verse 24, And all the trees of the field will know that I, God, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, God, have spoken and have done it. And with considerably more vividness, in Ezekiel chapter 31, we read specifically about Assyria. Now, the difference, of course, between what Isaiah writes about Assyria and what Ezekiel writes about Assyria is Isaiah is telling us, telling his audience, about what is about to happen. The impending doom of Assyria. For Ezekiel, that impending doom had happened long ago. On the contrary, in Ezekiel, 
it is a warning. Remember what happened to Assyria? In chapter 31, verse 3, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. Same motif. With fair branches, with shady woods, and of a high stature. And its top was among the thick or interwoven boughs. The waters nourished it deep, made it to grow tall. Verse 5, therefore, its stature was exalted above all the trees of the field. And then what happens? Verse 10, therefore, thus says God the Lord, because you are exalted in stature, and he has set his top among the thick or interwoven boughs, and his heart is lifted up in his height. The heart lifted up. Again, arrogance, pride. Verse 11, I do even deliver him into the hand of the powerful one of the nations. He shall surely deal with him. I do drive him out according to his wickedness. And strangers, the dreaded of the nations, do cut him off and cast him down. The message, again, verse 14, to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves in their stature, neither set their top among the thick or interwoven boughs, nor that their powerful ones stand up in their height, even all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death. That message, that humbling, again, is a message that recurs repeatedly in Scripture, very briefly. In King David's song, in the second book of Samuel, in chapter 22, in verses 27 and 28, with the pure, you show yourself pure. With the perverse, you show yourself crooked. The afflicted people, you save. But your eyes are upon the haughty, that you may humble them. In Psalm 147, Verse 6, God upholds the humble. He humbles the wicked down to the ground. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23, a man's pride shall humble him. But he who is of humble spirit shall attain to honor. Now this is obviously of utmost relevance when we consider the impending doom of which the prophet speaks with respect to Assyria. That in that onslaught, remember, the end note is, this very day he shall stand at Nov, shaking his hand at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem, shaking in mockery, derision. We saw those words of derision expressed by his emissaries to King Hezekiah and his attendance on the walls of Jerusalem, the arrogance. I can vanquish them all. I can even vanquish God. And that message then. The Lord, the God of hosts, shall lop the boughs with terror, with saw, everything cut down. The high ones of stature are hewn down, the lofty, shall be humbled. This in marked contrast to what we read in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 32, about King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. In those days, now, those days, as we read in the previous verses, are precisely the days of this battle, the days of this wondrous salvation from Assyria. Hezekiah was sick even unto death, and he prayed unto God, and he, God, spoke unto him and gave him a sign. Now on the one hand, in verse 25, without further clarification, without further elaboration, we'll have occasion, God willing, to return to this passage and consider just what it is intimating. But we read in verse 25, Hezekiah rendered not according to the benefit done unto him, 
for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, in verse 26, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of God came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. So on the one hand, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart. He was the one who was humble, whom God exalts. Whereas Sennacherib, Sanchariv, Assyria, was the prideful, arrogant, lofty one whom God humbles. That's, on the one hand, obviously the dynamism that we're reading here. And of course, it pertains to what is the fate of Assyria. I can't help but add here that apropos of what we discussed at the beginning this evening with respect to words of the prophet that necessarily will be fulfilled but may not be fulfilled immediately, could be that what we're reading here about Hezekiah's heart being lifted up even though he did humble himself for the pride of his heart, maybe that was the reason that the words of the prophet were not in their entirety fulfilled. We have an ancient tradition that God at least considered the plan that King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, would be the Messiah. That the battle of Gog and Magog, about which, of course, we read explicitly only much later in Ezekiel chapter 38, that could have been the battle of Sennacherib, of Sanchirid, against Jerusalem. It could have been. Might have been. Maybe should have been. The time wasn't right. On some level, King Hezekiah, despite his explicitly recorded righteousness, was not worthy of being the Messiah. So, of course, inevitably, the words of the prophet remain still in abeyance, awaiting their ultimate utmost fulfillment. What happened at the time was still, of course, a wonder of extraordinary proportions. And this, as we've already noted in the past, we read in vivid detail in Isaiah chapter 37, when King Hezekiah sends to the prophet Isaiah to apprise him of the blasphemy of the king of Assyria, Isaiah sends unto Hezekiah, beginning in verse 21 here, thus says God, the God of Israel, whereas you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib's king of Assyria, this is the word that God has spoken concerning him. The virgin daughter of Zion has despised you and left you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at you. Do you think you're shaking your hand at Jerusalem? You don't know what's coming. Verse 31. And the remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion they that shall escape. The zeal of the God of hosts shall perform this. Therefore, thus says God concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come unto this city, nor shoot an arrow there, neither shall he come before it with shield, nor cast a mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come unto this city, says God. For I will defend this city to save it, for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And in verse 36, we read the faith of the Assyrian army. 
the angel of God went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. And the siege was not. Jerusalem was saved. Now, of course, inevitably, when we continue now with Isaiah chapter 11, again, those prophetic verses concerning the coming of the Messiah, we realize very well what we've already noted. That is, on the one hand, chapter 11, verse 1, necessarily follows on the heels of the devastation, the utter destruction of Assyria. And to that extent, these words should be fulfilled in the shoot that goes out of the stock of Jesse, the twig that is King Hezekiah. But simultaneously, once again, we recognize that these words necessarily will have a far broader historic import because they did not attain complete fulfillment in the time of King Hezekiah. The portrayal, the metaphor here, is one that nonetheless we should stress, especially because of its recurrence in the words of later prophets. There shall go forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse. A twig shall grow forth out of his roots. Note that in much the same vein that the Assyrian Empire is described as a forest that God is chopping down and everything is hewn down and humbled, here it is a veritable stump. All that's left is the stock of Jesse. But from that seemingly barren stump shall go forth a shoot. And even if there isn't even a stump left, a twig will grow forth out of his roots. Same metaphor of the tree. Now, the metaphor of the tree obviously can be understood on many different planes. Trees have deep roots and trees reach toward heaven. So, after all, do human beings. And in particular, the tree represents continuity. The tree that is cut down is what presumed to be everlasting, destroyed by God. The tree that, even after having been cut down, produces a new shoot. That's the symbol of God's ongoing providence with respect to the house of David. And indeed, it is in that vein that we read likewise in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, different enemy, different circumstances, same symbol. Behold, the days come, says God, that I will raise unto David a righteous shoot, and he shall reign as king and prosper and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now, obviously, this is not referring to King Hezekiah because Jeremiah is long after King Hezekiah has gone. To whom is Jeremiah referring? He doesn't say. Considering that the king in his time, Tzedekiah, Tzedekiah, has a name that means righteous of God, but unfortunately he wasn't. Speaking of a righteous shoot is, if anything, speaking of someone unseen, uncrowned, yet, but who will be coming? And there is a promise. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, God is our righteousness. 
interesting that the same motif of shoot and the same name, albeit applied to something else, recurs in Jeremiah chapter 33, beginning in verse 14. Behold, the days come, says God, that I will perform the good word that I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and concerning the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause a shoot of righteousness. Same expression. A shoot of righteousness to grow up unto David. And he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved. And Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby she shall be called. Here the name is of Jerusalem. God is our righteousness. And that message of the shoot is, verse 17, for thus says God, there shall not be cut off unto David a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. In verse 22, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levite that minister unto me. It's hard for me to read that verse without expressing on a personal note what I think I've shared with you in the past, and that is that um, we have a genealogy in the family, at least on one branch of the family. We are indeed descended seed of King David. So God's promise is irrevocable. And that shoot will sprout. And of course, we note here with particular emphasis, as we saw it in both chapter 23, verse 5, he shall reign as king and prosper and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In chapter 33, verse 15, he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. What indeed the prophet Isaiah tells us about this shoot that goes forth out of the stock of Jesse. The spirit of God shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. And he shall be animated by the fear of God and shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the humble of the land. And he shall smite the land with the rod of his mouth and with the spirit of his lips shall he slay the wicked and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. And it's not just Jeremiah that is in Zechariah as well. This is already the second temple period. But here in context, there is an address for this prophecy. When in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8, we read the message of God through the angel to Joshua, the high priest. You and your fellows that sit before you, for they are men who are worthy of a sign. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the shoot. Here it seems to be a name, the shoot. And who is the shoot? In context, it certainly appears pretty clear that the shoot is Zerubbabel, the king of restored Judah, albeit restored Judah as a vassal state. He is only reigning at the pleasure of the Persians, but nonetheless, Zerubbabel reigns from the house of David. He is, at the time, the shoot. And there is the promise, I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. And that day, says the God of hosts, you shall call every man his neighbor unto the vine and unto the fig tree. Now here too, we'll ask, was this really completely fulfilled? And answer, not yet. The shoot. On one level, was Zerubbabel. On one level, well, we know that shoot coming forth from the stock of Jesse. 
we still await. We still await the complete fulfillment. Likewise, in Zechariah chapter 6, we see the same motif once again. This, too, is the message to Joshua, the, ho- the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Thus speaks the God of hosts in chapter 6, verse 12. Behold, a man whose name is the shoot, who shall shoot up out of his place and build the temple of God. This is Zerubbabel. And he shall bear the majesty and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Between King Zerubbabel, priest Joshua. It's not a complete fulfillment. But it's a glimmer. It's a glimpse of that. This will all happen if you will diligently hearken to the voice of God your Lord, which is maybe why it hasn't been completely fulfilled yet. But it's happening. It is going to take place completely. We see this process unfolding. And it's an historical process that could have many chapters into which it's divided. On the one hand, there is the cataclysm of the destruction of Assyria and the shoot of the stock of Jesse, the righteous King Ezekiel. And there's the chapter that Jeremiah describes prophetically and the chapter that Zechariah describes as fulfilled, but still only partially with Zerubbabel. And as the world convulses in this ongoing process, it draws inexorably closer to ultimate salvation. And that brings us to the final verses that we'll be discussing today, which are, of course, extraordinary, literally extraordinary, and inevitably, therefore, we don't really know exactly what to make of them. In verse 6, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb? It's not a question, it's a statement. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and a calf and young lion and fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like cattle. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wheeled child shall put his hand on the basilisk's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. What does it mean? We see almost the self-same expression later on in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 65, and here it becomes increasingly difficult to read these words in anything other than the prophet's vision of the redemption in the future. He speaks of a time, another time. They shall build houses and inhabit them and plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat, for as the days of a tree shall be the days of my people. And my chosen shall outlive the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth to terror, for they are the seed blessed of a God and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb, sound familiar, shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like cattle. Dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. You know, those words are identical with Isaiah 
chapter 11, verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. But we still ask, what does it mean? In Hosea, in chapter 2, we see a similar sort of statement, but the context itself may lead us to wonder just how are we to understand the wild animals living peaceably. Because in chapter 2, verse 20, we read, In that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of the heaven and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow. Break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the land. And I will make them to lie down safely. And, of course, the culmination of that, which, in a different vein, resonates with the second half of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. The earth will be full of knowledge of God as the waters cover the seabed. I will betroth you to me forever says Hosea in chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. Yeah, I will betroth you unto me in righteousness and in justice and in loving kindness and in compassion. And I will betroth you unto me in faithfulness. And you will know God. Same theme, knowledge of God. So is it really that wild animals will become docile? Could be that just as Hosea speaks of the wild animals together with breaking the bow and the sword and the battle out of the land, that maybe it's all a metaphor for nations that were preying on one another like wild animals living in peace with one another. That is, maybe this is an allusion to what we read in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. And this also had to do with attaining knowledge of God. Remember in verse 3 it was, go and let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth Torah, teaching, and the word of God from Jerusalem. So there's knowledge of God. And then, verse 4, he will judge between the nations and will decide, reprove many peoples, and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So maybe that's what he meant. That is, wild animals may remain wild animals. But nations that behave like wild animals will live in peace. That is a possibility. There are commentators, Bible scholars, to understand these passages in Isaiah and in Hosea in that vein. But we must admit there's also another possibility. Remember back at the beginning? In Genesis chapter 1, when God creates man, he blesses man to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that creeps upon the earth. Dominion, because everything is living in peace. And you oversee them all. With respect to what you eat, God says to man, I have given you every herb yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food, and, in verse 30, to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every living thing that creeps upon the earth, wherein there is a living soul, I have given every green herb for food. I've given every green herb. Only. The plants. Not predation. Not eating the flesh of other animals. So it is entirely plausible that when we get to this world of the future, this world of the future, when everyone knows God, that things will be restored to 
what they were like before a restoration to Genesis chapter 1. Even the natural world will become nonviolent, will become docile once again. Of course, ultimately, we'll wait and find out when we get there. But both possibilities work. The main thing, and this undoubtedly is the main thing, is the message of verse 9. Again, they shall not hurt nor destroy it in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of God as the waters cover the seabed. That is, whatever happens, to whatever extent they neither hurt nor destroy, it's only because of that, of the knowledge of God, that knowledge of God indeed fills the earth. As we read likewise in Jeremiah chapter 24, in verse 6, once again, the promise, as we just saw it in the words of Isaiah chapter 65, I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them back to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. In verse 7, and I will give them a heart to know me, knowledge of God that I am God, and they shall be my people. And perhaps even more forcefully in Jeremiah chapter 31, we've discussed these verses previously, in verses 32 and 33, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says God. I will put my Torah, my teaching, in their hearts, in their inward parts, their midst, in their heart will I write it. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, no, God, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them. Knowledge of God. Likewise, the prophet Habakkuk in chapter 2, in almost the exact same words as Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9, we read in verse 14, after indeed punishment is visited upon the wicked, the earth shall be filled with knowledge of the glory of God as waters cover the seabed. Which brings us to one final crucial point with which we conclude. What do we mean by knowledge of God altogether? Obviously, knowledge of God isn't something that gives God something. It's only for us. God is absolute truth, absolute goodness, absolute justice, absolute righteousness. Knowledge of God is knowledge of these. Serving God is serving these. And maybe most specifically, we should conclude with the words of Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 22 and 23, which are so apropos here. We spoke all about the arrogance, the haughtiness, the loftiness of those who need to be humbled. Verse 22, thus says God, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Verse 23, but let him who glories glory in this, only in this, that he understands and knows me. For I am God who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For these I desire, says God. Knowing God is knowing this and acting this way, exercising kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth. In short, it is precisely that that results from the earth being full of the knowledge of God. It is a peaceable world where violence is ended. It is a king who judges with complete righteousness. 
It is everything we see in this world, finally, at long last, fixed up. It's very instructive for us to see this message, to see this progression from arrogance to humility, from brazenness to knowing God and serving him. We're not there yet, but the prophet gives us a roadmap. He gives us a glimpse of a world convulsing, but convulsing on the pathway to salvation. May we take this roadmap as our guide and heed his words to bring that blessed day closer. God bless you.